there's a mapping influence that results from kind of interest in, in both the kind of macro scale of mapping and the micro scale of mapping. So biology and neurology are definitely kind of mapping driver, as well as you know uh, mapping in my travels. I sailed on the ocean for three years. And so my life was literally reliant upon maps and information and negotiating my environment. This is a familiar scene. Tourists who have lost their way. Like all other maps, this is a drawing to scale of a portion of the Earth's surface on which natural and man-made features are depicted by symbols, lines, and colors. At first glance, it may appear confusing with all sorts of lines and symbols you have never before encountered. Mapping is a fascinating means of identifying the salient elements of my environment, our environments, and putting them down in relationship to each other. If you select a map which covers the area of your travels and know how to interpret the information it contains, the map will guide you to your destination. For these travelers, the relatively simple map serves this purpose, enabling them to visualize the route they must travel to reach their destination. It's a way of organizing the world so that we can negotiate our environment in, in the way that we want to. I see that through all of my work today, whether it's the collaborative things that we're doing here or the things I'm doing privately in my studio. And here, is one of the wonderful things about collaborative, working collaboratively, is that I'm gonna do it different than you're gonna do it. You're gonna do it different than he's gonna do it. And we're all gonna be, approach this. We're all, same set of instructions, we're all gonna do it a little bit differently. And the sculpture's gonna have life because of that. As it's installed and the weather starts to take effect and the white starts to fall away, some areas will fall away faster than others partly because of their size, partly because of our technique, and that's what collaboration is all about. The collaborative component has been a part of my work for a decade. I can create a setup and kind of get a degree of control in terms of a sequence of events which leads to a sculpture, but then I hand over part of that process. So it's kind of like being a choreographer and then you have the dancers who contribute to the actual performance. Then when we move from the two-dimensional into the three-dimensional, I have to go back to being the artist again, where I take that information and I interpret it at scale, three-dimensionally, in material. One of the reasons that I originally decided to be trained in doing sculpture is because I really like the idea of the resistance of the material, how wax behaves and how wood or steel or the density and the grain of a material really gives feedback that the artist has to respond to. Fast forward to today, where the collaborative element of these drawings is part of the resistance, to me, of process. Something for me to continually adjust my ideas and make them work relative to what we get. The people who come in here today and contribute to that drawing are gonna do something that I can only think I know what's gonna happen. In the end, there's gonna be an image there that I have to use that's gonna feed the sculpture in a way that I didn't anticipate. And that is the resistance that's so beautiful about the collaborative process. We're gonna have several uh, people come participate in the raw material of the sculpture that eventually I'll be installing at Grounds for Sculpture. I'm going to invite them to sit down and work individually on their own memories and generate a map from their memories that is based on the spaces that they inhabited in their childhood. Understanding that your memory of that space, like my memory of the space that I grew up in, is gonna be distorted in a really authentic way, in a really good way, by my experience as a six or seven year old child, right? So you can, if you lay that space out, and your sister lays that space out, and your mother or your child or whatever laid that space out, space out is all going to be different and that's good, right? So it's not about being right, it's about being true relative to your memory. They're going to take that drawing and then transfer it, enlarge it to fit this giant piece of paper in front of us. 
they will, of course, each of them be overlapping from each axis of this drawing, overlapping with each other, and getting a very layered result. It's going to be hard to read any individual drawing, and that's a good thing. I want that weave of all those memories together to create the map from which the sculpture will be generated in three dimensions. I love that they weave together and you can't really say, oh, that's this one person, that's the same. It doesn't weave, like, it's, when it gets complex enough that they are not discernible as one from the other, that's the right stage. That's, that's where I wanted to get to. One of the things that I'm fascinated with in my own ideas, but I think also in the world of ideas, is how they go from this incredible complexity in our minds of formlessness without syntax. They're incredibly complex. And then when they, when they emerge from us, they become language, or they become drawings, or they become buildings, or they become something in the physical world. That process, to me, is fascinating. We formalize our ideas. So drawing is, in effect, a formalization of a concept that we have. The sculpture wants to read like a drawing on paper. In order for that to happen, we really need the surface to be consistent. Right? In other words, we really want to read the face of the red, which is on the opposite side, and the face of the white, which is going to be down as well, as being on one surface. And we can't have big gaps or even small gaps in between the red and the white in order for that to happen. So here's what I want you to do is take small handfuls and without squishing, you want to use your fingers like little hammers. So idea goes to drawing and that's the first stage of it and then drawing becomes a three-dimensional object becomes a sculpture in this case. The sculpture is like a drawing on a big piece of paper, and the paper falls away and becomes a drawing again. So it's idea to drawing to sculpture, and then a return to the drawing. That's part of the life cycle that I'm looking to address. And uh, one of the brilliant things about what Grounds for Sculpture has asked me to do is make this, uh, the sculpture itself have a life cycle which is reflective of the conceptual basis. So the sculpture will be created from these drawings, will be installed, and then it will succumb to the forces of nature over the course of the next couple of years. And it's not just going to disintegrate, it's going to have a phase shift that's designed into the sculpture that it moves from one state into a distinct second state, which will have its own meaning relative to the drawing to sculpture process.